Newark Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So once again, we are continuing our series called Understanding the Jews. This is now lesson number 182, and tonight's lesson is entitled King Solomon, Part 18. So last week, we spent the entirety of our time uh, on Jeroboam's unexpected meeting with the prophet Ahijah. And that occurred while he was on his tra travels out of Jerusalem, uh, going northwards towards the new area of his administrative responsibilities. And we covered how he was informed by Ahijah that God was going to take ten tribes away from Solomon's kingdom and give them to him, over which, of course, he would then himself be king. Talk about something out of the blue. Uh, that news had to be quite a revelation to Jeroboam. And we said last week that what God was going to do in dividing the kingdom was certainly what we would describe as the big picture. But we recognize that this week we needed to go back and try to get some understanding about the details of that prophecy. From a practical standpoint, which ten of the twelve tribes of Israel are we talking about? And why those particular ten? Or to state it another way, which two tribes are left? And why those two? Well, it seems to me that the easiest course to begin with would be with the two tribes, the two that are going to be left, the two tribes that were going to be given to Rehoboam. Now, those tribes are referred to, referred to in 1 Kings 11, but they were not specifically named. So, for the time being, I want to focus our attention on that passage. Let's go to 1 Kings 11, verses 31 and 32. The scripture reads, And he said to Jeroboam, Take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. So Ahijah says that one tribe will stay in Solomon's kingdom for the sake of his father David. And one tribe will remain in Solomon's kingdom for Jerusalem's sake. Question number one, from which tribe did David come? To which tribe did David belong? That would be the tribe of Judah. And Judah was to, pre was to be protected because it was under God's promise, a unilateral promise that he had made to David through or by the prophet Nathan. So I want to look at that for just a moment. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 11 through 17. The scripture reads, And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I 
will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. So this passage speaks of the house of David, of his son Solomon, and of his seed after him. And we have one of the great promises in the Bible right here. A promise that God made to David that his house <clears throat> and his throne would last forever. And David's house was a house of the tribe of Judah. And God protected Judah when David's son Solomon was judged. And the kingdom was stripped from his son Rehoboam. Stripped of all but two tribes. So Judah was one of the two tribes that remained. Question number two. What was the other tribe that remained of the kingdom that Solomon passed to his son? And for what reason was that tribe spared? Well, we saw in 1 Kings 11.32 that after Judah, which was spared for David's sake, there was one more tribe that was spared. And I'll quote the scripture, quote, for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all Israel. Close quote. Of course, it was in Jerusalem that the house of God had been built. And God says here that it was he himself who chose that city to be the location of his temple. And... It was also the location of what? David's throne. And it was the place where God agreed to put his name. And irrespective of the sins of either Solomon or Rehoboam, that temple and that throne and that city needed to, re to remain associated with the house and the lineage of David. And so now we have to ask, within which tribe was Jerusalem located? And that would be the tribe of Benjamin. So the tribe of Benjamin was going to be inextricably linked to the tribe of Judah. And that was because it needed to honor that very same purpose that we just talked about. In fact, by this time, the time that we're studying right now, the process whereby Benjamin was essentially assimilated into its much larger neighbor, Judah, had already begun. And over time, whenever you spoke of Judah, it was understood that you were including Benjamin. We will see that more clearly as we continue with this train of thought. So when all is said and done, Rehoboam will be king over only Judah and Benjamin, those two. But now we get to go on to the more confusing part of this tribal division. What about Jeroboam? 
And what about the ten tribes that Ahijah said was coming to him? What about them? It's not as simple as you might think. So I want to go back and use our often used exhibit number 12. Uh, and hopefully that will help us sort things out. So exhibit 12 is going to show us again the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm going to leave this slide up here for a few minutes as we walk our way through this. So as we all know, the 12 tribes of Israel are headed up and named after the 12 sons of Jacob. And looking at this slide, you will see that there are 12 tracts of land designated by 12 different colors. And that seems right, except for what? There are only 10 of Jacob's sons accounted for on this map. Joseph and Levi are missing. Neither Joseph nor Levi are identified with one of these tracts of land. So what gives? Well, starting with Levi, <clears throat> we have covered in previous lessons that Levi was a tribe of priests. And as such, it was needful for them to be dispersed throughout all of the other 11 tribes to carry out their priestly duties within each one of them. And because they didn't have their own land, it was required that the other tribes would take care of the Levites who were living within their borders. Okay, so that explains the reason for the Levites not showing up on Exhibit 12. But if they are not there, why is there still 12 names on that exhibit? Well, again, in previous lessons, we did go over this. We went over how Joseph was assigned a double portion in the promised land. And those two tracks are accounted for by the names of his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So, with Joseph's sons claiming their father's double portion, the land divisions are now back at the number of 12. So far, this is all well and good. But there is still one last apparent discrepancy to resolve before we can assign the correct 10 tribes to Jeroboam. What is it? Well, we know that when the kingdom was divided, it was divided geographically. By that I mean those tribes that were in the north and those tribes that were in the south. In fact, those two kingdoms are most often referred to in that manner, i.e. the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So looking again at Exhibit 12, you will observe what appears to be a very odd circumstance. And that is that the tribe of, well, it's not really showing up too well on here, but the tribe of Simeon is right here in the middle of this large green area that's designated for Judah. That's the location of the tribe of Simeon. As you can plainly see, that makes them right in the middle of this land assigned to Judah. And if their new king, Jeroboam, is reigning in the north, and his throne is way up in Samaria, and Simeon is down south, surrounded on all sides by Judeans, and those Judeans have a different king, I ask you, how could that even work? I would submit that it couldn't. That's not going to work. 
one of two things was going to have to happen. Either they would have to agree to stay under King Rehoboam, which according to God's prophecy would not be permitted, or they would have no alternative but to migrate north and to make their home with the other secessionists. And while there is no direct evidence of such a migration, there is in fact a passage of scripture that does support that very circumstance. And for that, we need to go forward in time to when King Josiah was reigning as king of Judah. And at that time, he was in the process of purging the land of false idols and false places of worship. And I want to pick it up in the fifth verse of 2 Chronicles chapter 34. And the scripture reads, And he, Josiah, burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars, their false altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. So according to this account here in verse 5, first Josiah cleansed Judah and Jerusalem, which equates to Judah and Benjamin, knowing that that's where Jerusalem was. But there's an interesting addition in the next verse, and that is because what Josiah does next seems to provide some clarity to what happened back in the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the time period when the nation was divided. Because after Josiah cleansed his own kingdom, the southern kingdom, he moved north, and he did some cleansing up there as well. So I want to go to 2 Chronicles 34, 6, which is the next verse. The scripture reads, And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. Now some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> by the time of Josiah, well, the northern kingdom had already been defeated by the Assyrians, and many of the residents had been forcibly deported. And that is true. It's all true. And so why was Josiah given liberty to conduct this purge uh, in Assyrian territory is not really known. Not for sure. Some think that because Judah was essentially a vassal state that the Assyrians gave Josiah certain freedoms over the remnants of the northern kingdom. Or, perhaps because Assyria was at that time close to its collapse, that they had other fish to fry and worrying about some pagan temples, the southern extent of their kingdom was not on their radar. In any event, None of that has any relevant effect on the description being made here in this passage that seems to provide evidence concerning the location of the tribe of Simeon. So now I want to go back to Exhibit 12 again. And as you can see, let me get my pointer back out here. Uh, Ephraim and Manasseh and Naphtali are all considerably north of Jerusalem. In fact, beginning your travels in Jerusalem, you would first go through Ephraim and then Manasseh before you get up to Naphtali. And by the time you get to Naphtali, well, you would be about as far north in the kingdom of Israel, or what was the old kingdom of Israel, as you could possibly get. Now this route, the one that Josiah would have been taking, has very strong geographical implications. It would make no sense to include Simeon in this group 
if Simeon was far, far to the south, south of Jerusalem. But verse 6 does that. As if Simeon was, in fact, in that same general area. And that tells me that the people of Simeon were, in fact, there. The best explanation can be attributed to the appearance of Simeon in that area because in the days when the kingdom split, the days of Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the tribe of Simeon packed up their bags and migrated north. They were part of the rebellion against Rehoboam. They had made their choice. And they did what they had to do. For Simeon to remain within the borders of Judah, surrounded on every side by hostile neighbors, would have been an untenable situation. So, up to this point, as we are still considering 1 Kings 11, 30 through 32, we have covered the what, but not the why. Jeroboam now understands what it is that's going to happen. But in order to provide Jeroboam with the confidence to know assuredly that he will be standing on solid ground, Ahijah is also going to tell him the why. Why it is. God is going to make him ruler over the majority of his master's kingdom. And the why of all of this is laid out in the next passage. And that's going to take us to 1 Kings 11, 33 through 37. And the scripture reads, and again, this is the why. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians. Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Howbeit, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake, whom I chose, because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give one tribe, that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel. So this is the why behind Jeroboam's unexpected anointing. And here God is repeating the very same indictment that he pronounced on Solomon back in verses 9 through 13 of the same chapter. And since we've covered the sins of Solomon outlined there in great detail, uh, we shall not repeat it again here. But now we're going to get into two verses that reveal the greatest of tragedies. Tragedies that we don't normally take note of when going through this portion of Scripture and certainly don't really associate with Jeroboam. So let's read it first, and then we'll try to appreciate the unnecessary and self-inflicted loss that both of these men have suffered. 1 Kings 11, 38 and 39. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, 
that I will be with thee and build thee a sure house as I built for David and will give Israel unto thee. And I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Now verse 38 here starts out addressing its message directly at Jeroboam. And I want you to notice that the promise that God is giving him is the very same promise that he had given to Solomon. Essentially, a sure house and a lasting kingdom, similar even to the one that he had promised to his beloved David. Now, God did stop short of using the word forever, as he did in reference to David's throne, but nonetheless, God was promising Jeroboam a long reign and a long and a lasting legacy a house that would stand the test of time. He just needed to be faithful to the God who was giving him the crown on his head. That was quite an offer. But alas, Jeroboam didn't keep up his end of the contract. In fact, as hard as it might be to believe, Jeroboam ended up in more idolatry and more sin than did Solomon. And as a result, the reward he was promised was canceled. And in the days when his son Nadab was king, a man named Baasha rose up against him. And Baasha not only killed Nadab, but he killed every last man in Jeroboam's family. There wasn't one single man left to carry on the family name for Jeroboam. Now you might say, okay, that fits the bill for Jeroboam, but Solomon was not even mentioned in verse 38. So where's his tragedy? Solomon suffers loss in this passage, not because his name is mentioned there, but because his name is absent. When God mentioned the name of a man to whom God wanted Jeroboam to emulate, it wasn't Solomon. Although Solomon was the man whom God anointed to be king and who was serving as king at that very time. Couldn't use Solomon as an example of a godly servant, because he wasn't. Now, we don't know exactly when, but Solomon did at some point get his priorities straight. In the book of Ecclesiastes, which Solomon wrote, he said that after he had tried all of the things in life that are supposed to bring one satisfaction, he concluded that all of them were empty, or as he put it, vanity. And so at the very end of the book, in chapter 12, he said that after all is said and done, all that is left for a man to do is what? To respect the God of heaven and to do his commandments. That's it. So what do you think that Solomon would trade to have his name mentioned alongside of his father David in verse 38? I dare say that he would have gladly traded everything. He would have traded it all. And it's a sad tragedy that God skipped over Solomon to name someone else because he himself was not worthy to be mentioned. And in verse 39, 
God ends his message to Jeroboam by saying that he could not ignore the sin of Solomon. And because of that, David's seed, in this case Rehoboam, would be afflicted. And that affliction would come in the form of his kingdom being torn asunder. But even here, God provides some hope. He says there would come a time when that affliction would end. So now, Ahijah has done what he came to do. And those two men go their separate ways. But we still have verse 40, a verse that we referred to earlier. So let's read it again. 1 Kings 11 and verse 40. The scripture reads, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam. And Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt unto Shishak, king of Egypt, or Pharaoh, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now previously, we only read this verse to show that Solomon became aware of both the existence of this meeting between Jeroboam and Ahijah and the meaning of Ahijah's demonstration of tearing his garment into 12 pieces. But now, we want to comment on what Solomon is doing in response. The scripture says that Solomon actually went after Jeroboam to kill him. Now keep in mind, Solomon has already received the very same information from God that Ahijah gave to <clears throat> Jeroboam. Nothing new there. And Solomon therefore knew that it was God's will that Rehoboam, or I'm sorry, Jeroboam, got to keep these straight, was going to be king over ten tribes in Israel. He knew that. This will show you how unbridled passion can blind even the most wise among us. Did Solomon really think that he could somehow subvert or cancel out what God had decreed? That God would actually allow him to kill Jeroboam before he could become king? That was not going to happen. So somehow, some way, if he didn't already figure it out on his own, somebody told Jeroboam that his life was in danger. And of course, of all the kings that we will study and have studied in the Bible, it seems pretty consistent. It's a consistent trait that they just do not like competition for their crown. And the usual method of dealing with that circumstance is to what? To eliminate the competition. So one way or another, Jeroboam thinks it wise to leave the country. And so he takes flight to Egypt, where he too is befriended by the Egyptian pharaoh. Now, this Pharaoh, Shishak, is not the man who was Pharaoh when Solomon married the former Pharaoh's daughter. Different Pharaoh. And apparently, the new Pharaoh decided to keep this matter secret, or, in the alternative, he felt secure enough that Solomon was not going to start a war just to get one man back. He would simply be satisfied that, well, <clears throat> Jeroboam was in exile and he was out of my hair. And Solomon would have been right. He was right. Jeroboam stayed in Egypt for all the days that Solomon reigned as king. 
But Solomon's reign did end, and so did his life. And his life ended much sooner than it should have. All because he was not faithful to his God. Let's go to the end of the chapter, 1 Kings 11, verses 41 through 43. Scripture reads, And the rest of the acts of Solomon, and all that he did, and his wisdom, are they not written in the book of the acts of Solomon? And the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was forty years. And Solomon slept with his fathers, and was buried in the city of David his father, and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. So now Solomon has passed on a new day, and the kingdom is about to begin under the hand of Solomon's son, Rehoboam. And we already know that Rehoboam is walking into a buzzsaw. And unfortunately, much of the coming chaos is going to be of its own making. And because we have studied God's prophecy in 1 Kings 11, we know what's going to happen in the aftermath of Solomon's passing. But Lord willing, next week, we're going to start seeing how it actually unfolded. So please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list, and until next time, shalom.